Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar, FinFish Aquaculture 101 for Coral Reef Managers. This webinar is co-sponsored by the Nature Conservancy's Micronesia Program, Global Aquaculture Program, and the Reef Resilience Network. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Sherry Wagner, and I'm the Reef Resilience Network Coordinator and the host for today's webinar. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. Today's webinar will be an hour and a half. It's being recorded and the recording will be sent out to our mailing list after the webinar and also posted on our website. And there will be a Q&A session at the end of the presentations. So today we're lucky to have a number of aquaculture experts with us. We have Robert Jones. He's the global agu aquaculture strategy lead at the Nature Conservancy. Julio Camperio is a PhD student in aquaculture at the University of Miami. Jonathan McKay is a marine spatial scientist at the Nature Conservancy. Stephen Victor is the Micronesia Program Director at the Nature Conservancy. And Tiffany Waters is a Global Aquaculture Manager at the Nature Conservancy, and she'll be facilitating our question and answer session today. So a big welcome to all of our presenters. Um, there are two ways you can ask questions during the question and answer session. You can use the question box anytime throughout the webinar to send questions, and we'll keep track of them for the end of the presentations. Or you can raise your hand during the question and answer session, and we'll call on you to ask your question during that time. You raise your hand by clicking on the small hand icon on your toolbar. And if you're having technical difficulties, such as trouble hearing or seeing the slides, please type a message in the question box and we'll try to help you resolve the issue. Um, so we're very excited on this webinar to share a new resource that was just launched, um, the Aquaculture Toolkit on the Reef Resilience Network website. The toolkit is designed for marine managers and practitioners who already have aquaculture in their area or are planning for it. And here's a screenshot with the URL at the top. So the toolkit contains information and resources on the global status of finfish aquaculture, including species, what species are being produced, and the trends of this growing sector in tropical reef areas, farming and culture methods, impacts on wild stocks, habitats, water quality, and fish health, and what can be done to mitigate these impacts, legal and regulatory frameworks to support sustainable development, um, environmental impact assessments for operations, site selection and area management approaches, and community-based aquaculture and the role of stakeholder participation and planning with a case study from Palau. And you're gonna hear much more about these topics today on the webinar. But before we go any further, we wanna learn a bit who, about who's um, joined today. So we have three poll questions for you. Um, I'll just go ahead and launch. The first poll is how familiar are you with finfish aquaculture? Uh, not at all, somewhat familiar or very familiar. So this will give our presenters today an idea um, about how much you guys know about aquaculture. Okay, looks like most people have voted. So let me share the results. Um, so it looks like uh, we kind of have about even, um, somewhat, and very, and some people not at all. So a little bit of a spread, like across the board. They're pretty close. So let me share the next poll with you. Um, we're interested to find out um, where everyone is um, joining from today and where you work. So go ahead and let us know which area um, is closest to where you work, or if you work in multiple um, ocean basins, you can click there. Okay, 
So let me close this one and I'll share the results with you. Okay, so it looks like mostly Caribbean, Atlantic, some Pacific, because and this is reflective a little bit of the time zone and we have some other. Great, okay, so one more question. Just about um, your role. Are you a marine resource manager? Um, a practitioner of aquaculture or cult aquaculturist, uh, scientist, researcher, student, or um, none of these roles really fit what you do. You can choose other. Okay, so let me share the results. It looks like we have a lot of scientists, researchers, other, and then marine resource managers and very few uh, agriculture practitioners. Great. So welcome everyone and thanks a lot for taking the poll. Let me just hide this. Okay. All right. So um, with that, I would like to turn it over to Robert Jones. He's the global lead for the Nature Conservancy's agriculture program. The program consists of active projects in seven countries designed to ensure agriculture operate, operates in harmony with nature and provides benefits to people. So go ahead, Robert, and Great. I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Sherry. Good evening and good morning to some of you. And thanks for joining us for the launch of the Reef Resilience Network's Aquaculture Toolkit and our 101 on finfish aquaculture. Uh, this is a collaboration between the Reef Resilience Network and TNC's Global Aquaculture Program and TNC's Marine Aquaculture Program. Uh, aquaculture is a really important topic and it's critical to get it right for the health of our ocean and the people that rely upon it. Uh, the stakes are extremely high and so it could be the benefits. It's an area that each of you as reef managers and scientists will have a big role in determining whether aquaculture will be a force for good or conversely result in negative impacts on um, marine ecosystems. Aquaculture is growing extremely rapidly around the world. As many of you know, at about 6% per year, it's the fastest growing form of food production. And it's larger today overall than wild fisheries or the beef or the beef sectors. And at TNC, we view this growth as both an opportunity from an environmental and social perspective, but also a significant challenge. It's an opportunity because aquaculture can actually be one of the best sources of animal protein production we have from a resource utilization perspective. To produce a pound of fish through um, marine aquaculture or finfish aquaculture, it results in one tenth of the greenhouse gas emissions compared to beef. In the, in the case of oyster aquaculture, it takes about one hundredth of the greenhouse gas emissions compared to beef production on a per unit basis. This is really important given that food production accounts for 25% of greenhouse gas emissions today. And it also accounts for 70% of habitat loss and 80% of freshwater usage. Aquaculture also shows similar efficiency compared to terrestrial animal agriculture in water and land usage. Fish in the sea due to climate change and overfishing are also getting less reliable to harvest. Aquaculture can play a key role in building resiliency in communities and creating long-term jobs as an alternative to wild fisheries. And of course, seafood is also good for us. It's a key source of protein, omega-3s, and other essential nutrients that are rare in other foods. Seafood's a critical part of our diet in the, in the developed and developing world alike. Next slide. And in some cases, such as with bivalves and seaweed, it's even possible that aquaculture can provide benefits back to the environment through nutrient mitigation, and habitat provisioning services. This is a really exciting opportunity to improve the health of the ocean while helping us reach food demand needs. Next slide. Aquaculture can also be a source of gender empowerment for communities such as these seaweed farmers in, in uh, Tanzania. Women today represent over 70% of the world's aquaculture workforce. Next slide. 
But in spite of these opportunities, there are big challenges with, associated with aquaculture, and they've mostly had to do with the fin fish aquaculture sector, which is the main topic of discussion today. Some of the impacts that we'll get into detail on uh, will include water pollution impacts. Aquaculture has contributed to eutrophic waters around the world. We now have about 500 dead zones around the world, and we need to reverse that trend. We don't need more contributions from aquaculture. Habitat degradation in some places in the world, such as Southeast Asia, aquaculture has accounted for 30% of mangrove degradation due to the development of aquaculture ponds. Uh, impacts on wild stocks, both in terms of genetic and feed impacts, can reduce genetic fitness of wild fisheries and put pressure on vulnerable fisheries resources. And finally, disease can result in transmission within the farm and also possibly outside the farm, posing a threat to wildlife. This is a picture from Hainan, China, where I was able to visit a few years ago and actually see this in person. Uh, it was quite impactful on me. And these big four impacts of aquaculture, which I have described, have too often been the case as aquaculture has developed around the world. So it's on us to make sure that we put an end to these impacts and aquaculture can really live up to the environmental and social promise we think it has. We also must be keenly aware that aquaculture in tropical areas in where coral reefs do exist must be subject to particular care given the sensitivity and immense stress already put on these ocean treasures. So that's why I think our discussion today here is so critical. Uh, the module we've developed in our discussion today is about how we can ensure mistakes of the past are not made and the industry can be managed in a sustainable and responsible way. Um, with that, it's my pleasure to introduce our panel. Uh, Julio Campario is currently uh, carrying out his PhD in aquaculture at University of Miami Residential School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences. He was previously working with the Nature Conservancy in 2019 to travel to Palau, Micronesia, and carry out nutrition research on locally farmed rabbit fish. Uh, Jonathan McCoy is a marine spatial scientist at CSS under contract with TNC and is currently working under a NASA funded project in Palau to address food security by building local capacity around siting and planning sustainable aquaculture. He holds an MS in Environmental Science from University of, or California State University, Los Angeles, and a BS in Marine Science from University of South Pacific, Fiji. Um, Stephen Victor is TNC Micronesia's pro program. Uh, TNC's Micronesia program is going to be discussing a case study in Palau and its efforts to develop sustainable aquaculture. Stephen's a native of Palau. He received his MS in uh, biology in 2002 and his BA, BA from uh, University of Guam. Stephen was a researcher at the Palau International Coral Reef Center from uh, 2002 to 2009. In 2009, Stephen joined the Conservancy as uh, a conservation planner uh, and since January 2016 has served as the director of the Micronesia program. Stephen's been taking a leading role in TNC Micronesia's program in, in community-based fisheries management and the development of alternative livelihoods uh, such as aquaculture. So thank you all very much and I will pass it over to Julio. Okay. okay. Hello everyone, my name is Julio Camperio um, and thank you Robert for the introduction. Um, today, I'll be focusing mo uh, mainly on the environmental impacts of uh, marine fin fish aquaculture and different mitigation strategies that can be um, carried out to uh, minimize those impacts. Um, so, next slide. Um, so, aquaculture is generally defined as the culture of uh, marine organisms in a confined and controlled environment. Um, those marine organisms can either be in the form of fin fish, um, as we can see in this image with the rabbit fish, it can be uh, shellfish and crustaceans, um, or micro and macro uh, algae. And the confined and controlled environment part of aquaculture can either be earthed ponds, inland of course, um, it can be um, coastal net pens or coastal, coastal cages, 
or as more uh, commercially advanced, it can be open ocean cages, um, traditionally used for salmon farming. Um, as you heard earlier, the toolkit of today's uh, talk will mainly focus on fin fish aquaculture in marine coastal environments. Uh, next slide. Um, so we, as we mentioned multiple times already, um, aquaculture um, can have um, potentially negative impacts on the environment if certain um, protocols and management strategies are not properly um, carried out. Um, and as Robert mentioned earlier, some of those impacts can be impacts to wild stocks, um, impacts to the local marine environment, general water pollution, um, and diseases and parasites um, that can be sourced from the farm. Now, it's very important to keep in mind that all sources of protein production can have detrimental impacts on the environment. And the best way to minimize those impacts is to carry out proper planning, correct management, and appropriate mitigation strategies before um, any of these um, impacts get um, too out of control to, um, to, carry, uh, to, to mitigate. Next slide, please. Um, so impacts to wild stock can come in um, mainly four different categories. It can be in the form of uh, removing wild species to use as fry in the net pens. Um, it can be in the form of fish escapes if the net containing the fish breaks. Um, entanglement of wild species, especially marine mammals and sea turtles and seabirds can occur. Um, and there is a, there can be detrimental effects um, from feed if proper feed quality and proper feeding amounts are not um, rigorous, rigorously followed um, throughout the operation of the farm. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so generally, aquaculture relies on a steady supply of fingerlings or fry to be stocked in these, in these cages, in these net pens. Um, and it, it is ideal and highly recommended to try and source those fries from local hatcheries. Um, if there is no hatcher available, then um, it's possible that over time, too many young fish will be removed from the wild, and that will impact the wild population because it will reduce their um, reproductive, reproductive capability. Um, and if, again, if there's no hatcher available and you have to remove uh, wild uh, fingerlings or fry from the, the ocean, try your best to not farm fish that are currently overfished because if you're just removing one more fish from the ocean of a stock that is um, overfished then you're reducing even more of those numbers um, in terms of the the escapements of fish it is very important to carry out regular gear monitoring and maintenance when a feed operator accesses the cage or the net pen to carry out daily feedings it's very important to take a look at the net and make sure there's no um, holes or rips um, in these situations, it's better to be proactive than reactive. Um, another option is to farm local species. So in case if there is an escapement, you're not introducing an invasive species into the local environment. And as I just mentioned earlier, it's better to be proactive and fix a gear that needs repair um, rather than fix a net that has already, that already has a hole in it. Um, in terms of entanglement of Y species, um, specifically about protected uh, marine mammals and sea turtles and seabirds try your best to site the cages away from areas that are known to be frequented um, by these animals some of these species are migratory and they follow specific routes so it is ideal and recommended to site these cages away from these areas um, and at the same time try and monitor um, the movement and patterns of these animals to see if they're getting too close to too close to a cage um, in terms of feed, the impacts of feed, it's important to understand that um, feed is one of the most expensive components um, in terms of operating the cages. Um, so it's very important to um, mainly make sure you're using um, commercial pellets rather than whole fish, fish trimmings or animal slaughter waste to feed the animals, um, as introducing these biologic materials can really deteriorate the um, water quality within the cage and in the surrounding environment um, and it's very important to not overfeed the fish in the cages um, this happens a lot of times that the feed the fish are satiated and they're not more hungry and the feed the farm operator keeps feeding 
um, causing too much feed to either sink to the bottom of the cage or float away. And that is just unnecessary amount of nutrients that is being added to the marine environment that especially if it sinks, it can accumulate and cause dead zones of oxygen, um, which are areas with deprived of oxygen and that can have serious detrimental effects. So it's very important to choose good quality feed, but also feed the fish the right amount and do not overfeed. Next slide, please. The second impact is um, impact to habitat, mainly looking at sensitive habitats. Some of those habitats can be uh, coral reefs, seagrass beds, uh, mangroves, um, coastal nurseries and spawning grounds. Um, so um, when a site is being proposed, it's very important to keep these sensitive, sensitive habitats in mind. Um, gear loss can also impact um, uh, the, the local marine ecosystem. Um, both with migratory species, but also um, if you have gear that is floating around, it can potentially damage um, local vessels. Um, and reduction of water quality is another big one, um, as uh, as Robert mentioned, especially in areas that have too many farms that are not well, that are not properly managed, there can be um, detrimental effects in the water quality and eutrophication. Next slide. Okay. So as I mentioned, some of the more sensitive habitats that we're trying to protect are coral reefs, seagrass beds, mangroves, um, nurseries, and spawning grounds. Um, that's why it's very important to assess the available areas in the area and choose an area that is far away from these sensitive habitats. A uh, general rule of thumb is stay, you need a distance of 200 meters um, from coral reefs, but that can change depending on in what country and region you're trying to, um, you know, farm. So each regulatory body will have their different minimum distance, but the further away you are from these sensitive habitats, the better. Um, account for vertical and horizontal distance from these um, sensitive habitats. Don't consider only the horizontal distance, but consider also the depth. You don't want to set up a farm or a cage that is directly above a coral reef or seagrass bed. And at the same time, you also want to account for current velocity and direction because the current will either bring these nutrients and fish waste either further in towards the coast if there's an incoming tide. Um, and if there is an incoming tide, then you're just bringing that excess nutrients into potentially sensitive habitats. So air, uh, site selection and choosing the appropriate air is very important. Um, damaging of gear, which can affect the local habitat, is uh, can be mitigated through regular monitoring. Um, if you see some gear that is in the process of deteriorating, try and replace it before it actually breaks off from your system. Um, and for a reduction in water quality, it's recommended to carry out an environmental impact assessment of the proposed site which basically takes into account the environmental parameters of that site and it determines if the production you plan for will have a negative effect on the environment. Um, so it's very important to try and assess this overall ecosystem balance to see if your production will have a negative effect or not. Um, and the last point is to monitor um, the local water quality. Ideally, you want to have some water quality parameters before you start the production and even before the construction of the cage or of the net pen so you have a baseline of water quality um, that can be temperature oxygen ph ammonia nitrites nitrates chlorophyll um, and all sorts of other parameters so once the production begins of the fin fish you can see which of these parameters are being affected so then you can take um, uh, appropriate mitigation strategies next slide please Um, the third uh, impact that fin fish aquaculture can have is um, general impact on water quality, which can cause water pollution. Um, a big factor in this is the addition of excess feed in the environment um, and overall waste produced by the fish. Um, environmental parameters can be um, impacted negatively, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and something to keep in mind is carrying capacity. And the general idea of carrying capacity is 
the amount of fish weight that a specific environment can sustainably sustain. Um, each environment, depending on different parameters that can be current, depth, temperature, tides, um, and other factors, each environment will have a, a different carrying capacity. So you don't want to go over that carrying capacity because then the environment will not be able to sequester the excess nutrients in the form of nitrogen and phosphorus. And that can have a trickle effect and cause a whole bunch of um, negative impacts on the, on the environment. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so as I think I already mentioned a couple of times, it is very important to avoid overfeeding the fish um, and try and use commercial pellets. Um, as I mentioned, pellets, if they sink, they will sink at the bottom and accumulate, and over time, um, they can cause a dead zone um, and completely make the area under the cage barren um, and the overall diversity and density of uh, marine um, marine animals in the in the in the benthic area um, will be negatively in, impacted. Um, site the cages in areas that have enough depth and distance from sensitive areas. A general recommendation is that the depth of the sea floor should be at least twice the depth of the cage. Um, and obviously, something to keep in mind, as I mentioned earlier, is current. You don't want the current to be constantly flowing towards a coral reef or a mangrove, um, because then that sensitive habitat will just be overloaded with potentially an excess of fish waste. Um, as I mentioned, determine the, the current velocity and direction, especially if you have incoming and outgoing tides. That's something you can, because if it's going incoming, it's going to um, flow closer towards the coast and potentially even populated areas. But if it's flowing out in the open ocean, then you have uh, more volume of water that can assimilate and sequester those nutrients. And as in many of these points, regular monitoring of water quality before and during production is very important. So you can see how your production is affecting the water quality in the area. Um, and another recommendation is try to take water quality parameters at different um, areas within the farm, downstream, upstream, within the cage at different depths. So you can start understanding the overall water quality of the area. Um, in terms of the excess carrying capacity, it is ideal to carry out um, a de and determine the carrying capacity limit um, these can be complex models, um, but there is a general idea that um, the higher density of fish you are farming, the less growth you require. So if you give the if you give fish in a confined space more space and more volume to swim around, they will be happier and they will grow quicker than if space is limited. Um, do not overstock an ecosystem that will not be able to sustain the nutrient accumulation. Every ecosystem has the ability to absorb a certain amount of nutrients. If that limit is surpassed, then there can be detrimental effects. It's very important to try and stay below that level. And as I mentioned earlier, proper planning um, dur during the site and cage uh, selection is very important. Um, different cages, depending on the species you're selecting, they are uh, recommended cages, but uh, planning and selecting the right site for the farm is incredibly important um, in the overall success of the productivity, but also to keep the environment healthy. Next slide, please. Um, diseases in farm fish is a complex um, topic because there are various factors that can cause an outbreak of a disease. Um, and diseases do greatly impact the productivity of the farm. Um, if your fish are sick, they will eat less, they will grow less, you can have mortality, which means you will have a smaller harvest at the end of the, of the season. Um, your harvest period might be extended because the fish are growing less. But at the same time, if you have mortality within the cage, you're also harvesting less fish, and so you have a smaller profit. So it's very important to try and control internal factors as much as possible. And you can see this in this diagram, External factors are generally hard to control because it's kind of up to the environment. But the internal factors on the right are factors that the farm operator and the manager can, um, can manage and they can try and control them as much as possible to have the fish healthy. If the fish are healthy, they will grow quickly 
and you can sell your fish at a sooner point rather than having um, a delayed harvest. And just like overall maintenance and um, observation of the cage, it's very important to be proactive and not reactive in case of disease. You want to try and catch a disease before it occurs rather than waiting until you see a whole bunch of your fish sick to then start acting. And in fact, it's more economical and more environmentally friendly, I would say, to try and be proactive rather than uh, reactive. Next slide, please. Um, so one of the impacts that can cause a disease is biofouling, which is the growth of marine um, of marine material on the nets of the cage. It's basically in the form of algae growing around the ropes of the nets. And what happens if when you have too much biofouling, you're actually limiting the amount of water flow going through the cage. If you're reducing that water flow, you're also reducing the, um, the concentration or, the, or, or oxygen rich water going through the cage um, and being absorbed by the fish. So if you have reduced water flow, you're also having reduced water quality and that can stress out the fish. And stressed out fish are more likely to be um, impacted by parasites which then, can let, which then can lead to diseases. So this is very important to regularly clean the nets when the cages are empty. You can either do so by going in the water and brushing the nets. You can remove the nets and bring them on land and scrub them down. But it's very important to try and remove as much of this uh, marine growth as possible because parasites love to burrow into this marine growth. And so once the parasite cyst develops into larva, it will hatch from the nets and then attack the fish. So the least biofouling you have on the cages, the happier your fish will be in the long run. Um, to reduce the diseases and parasites, it is ideal to maintain a reduced stocking density. Stocking density is the amount of fish you have in a specific volume. And as I mentioned earlier, there's a general idea that if you have too many fish in a cage, growth will be reduced. While if you have more fish in a cage, then the fish will grow faster and happier. Um, a recommendation is to not install cages too close to each other. And I think if you recall from the picture Robert showed us, there's hundreds of cages one next to each other. And that is not ideal because if you have one cage that gets sick and the current is moving downstream, then you might be transferring that disease or that parasite downstream to all the other cages. So it's good to have the cages spread out. Um, another thing to keep in mind is when you're feeding the fish or you're monitoring on the daily, daily routine is to observe physical changes and physical, physical and behavioral changes of the fish. Um, these two changes are very important into determining whether the fish are sick or not. Um, if they're feeding less, um, if they're usually a schooling fish, but you see them not schooling, if they're at the bottom of the cage, if they're rubbing their sides on the net, that's a general uh, indication that there's a parasite. If their fins are rotting, if their eyes are popping out, if they have lesions on their skin, these are all indications that there's something wrong with the fish and appropriate mit uh, mitigation strategies need to be carried out to prevent fish mortality. And the final point is the nutrition, the nutritional perspective of the fish. Um, as I mentioned multiple times, it's ideal to feed commercial pellets to farm fish, specifically because now they are uh, producing commercial pellets that are specific um, for different species of fish, which these feeds uh, meet the nutritional requirements of these fish in terms of protein, lipid, carbs, and energy, these feeds are formulated for specific fish. So that when the fish eat this pellet, they are acquiring all the nutrients they need to grow um, in a healthy way. So that is one big recommendation to try and reduce diseases is to use a good quality, um, good quality feed. Next slide, please. Um, so as a final take-home message, first of all, it's important to understand that all these impacts are somewhat interrelated and they can all be, these impacts can be minimized if um, planning before any construction um, takes place. It's important to choose your site appropriately, choose your cage appropriately, um, an environment that um, will have minimal impacts. Um, locate potential errors through site selection. Um, is there 
um, keep in, with keeping in mind currents, the velocity and the direction, the depth of the cage, the kind of depth, the kind of seafloor you're working with, and whether there are any um, sensitive habitats in the areas is very important. Um, try your best to get access to environmental data before you begin any construction. So you can see once you're producing a specific kind of fin fish to see if you are having any, any negative impact in water quality, because then you can compare your present data to past data that you collected. And on the fish need to be fed every single day. So there is going to be someone on the farm every single day and it's their duty to observe the fish, their health and see if they're behaving in a strange way or if they're eating enough because that is very important to determine if there's any parasites and diseases, um, and then you can take appropriate actions. Um, so my presentation is done, and I will pass on the virtual microphone to Jonathan. And thank you for your time, everyone. So I'm gonna be presenting on marine spatial planning or siting. You can go to the next slide. So in this slide here, we have an infographic that helps explain uh, spatial planning or siting. Um, and siting is the first and most important step in aquaculture planning. And what does good siting mean? Well, for us, it means locating a farm uh, that doesn't impact the environment, works with the community, and for the business as well. And when we look at this infographic, we can see that there's different factors or different areas that we would want to avoid when planning aquaculture. And starting at the top of this image, that round circle is just an aerial overview of the uh, area. So we can see in green, these are areas that we would want to site aquaculture, avoiding these areas that are in orange. And these orange areas, in this case, it might be important fishing areas, could be a coral reef, a nearby coral reef. And then close to shore, it could be a mangrove or a seagrass bed. So those are areas that we want to avoid. Um, but for the business, we also want to make sure that there's a port nearby. Um, you want to make sure that there's the uh, facilities that would sustain the aquaculture in the area. Um, and when we say smart siting or aquaculture siting, it's, it's really the process of finding ocean space for aquaculture farms uh, that doesn't conflict with other ocean users. Avoid the areas that contain sensitive habitat, such as, like I mentioned, coral, like coral reefs, mangrove areas, seagrass beds. Um, and you can go to the next slide. And with this, we also have um, 20 key factors when uh, planning a farm. So we have 20 here. You can go to the next slide. And I'll go into detail in a, in a few of those. Um, but there's three main areas that these factors cover. It's environmental, social, cultural factors, and operations and logistics. So starting with the environmental factors, as Julio mentioned, you know, depth plays an important part in fish health. It also plays an important part when we talk about siting. So we want to site a farm where there's deep enough water, that there's strong enough currents to flush any excess nutrients. That's good for fish health, but it's also good for the environment in general. Um, so we recommend a uh, depth between 20 and 60 meters. Um, and then we also want to think about the water quality, temperature, and salinity in the area. Uh, you know, has the water quality been tested? Is there enough dissolved oxygen for the fish? Do we have measurements on that? Uh, what are the temperature ranges? And these are data that we can use to help site a farm. Next slide, please. So when we talk about um, political, regulatory, and social cultural factors. Um, we wanna make sure that there's uh, avoidance of other uses in the area. This could be things like tourism. It could be uh, a tourism, uh, a resort nearby you may wanna avoid. Um, and we also wanna be careful about, you know, important fishing areas. And that's where a lot of the local knowledge comes in for these siting analysis. 
So we want to make sure we avoid those areas and reduce those use conflicts. Um, you know, is is there an important dive site nearby? So those are some of the factors that you want to think about when planning aquaculture, uh, especially when you're thinking about social and cultural factors. Uh, next slide, please. So looking at the um, you know operational and logistics, you know, we want to think about things like costs. You know, is there fingerlings? Is there a small fry available uh, near this location, or will they have to be brought in from far away? Uh, you know, are is there local capacity to um, to grow these fish uh, on shore before they're put out in cages to um, to grow? Uh, is there the availability in, of feeds nearby? Uh, how far from shore is this location? You know, are you going to be using a lot of fuel to get out to this site to monitor it to harvest fish? Um, you know, is there is there a hatchery on shore that can support that industry? So, so these are some other factors that you need to think about. All up, we have uh, 20 different factors. Um, through this toolkit that you can access and read more about each one um, on those three main um, main categories of environmental, social and cultural, and operations and logistics. Um, so next, I, I want to tell you more about a project in Palau. If you go to the next slide. Um, so there's a, a good example of some siting that we're doing in the Republic of Palau. It's a project led by TNC in partnership with the government of Palau. And uh, it comes through a, a NASA grant to identify areas that are suitable for aquaculture development. Uh, and the project aims to site or locate aquaculture sustainably to help improve food security while preserving Palau's pristine marine environment. And what we have on the screen right now is just a pretty basic uh, layout of how we run one of these spatial analysis. And this is a, a computer um, exercise that we do. We feed in data. And as you can see in this, we have two different data types, vector and raster data. So your raster data could be things like satellite imagery. You could have sea surface temperature. Uh, you could have a bathymetry layer that was derived from satellite images. And then we have vector data, things like uh, important um, channels for boats. You could put in that data. You might have important areas for specific species, like um, there's a turtle nesting beach, or there's a dugong area um, where sensitive habitats are, like coral reefs. So we feed in data, and the model um, produces a suitability score, where one is the highest um, and the most suitable for aquaculture, and zero would be incompatible with aquaculture. Um, so once we feed in all that data, um, we get um, results for the suitability model. And if you go to the next slide, I have uh, an example of some of the results. Uh, so this is for Republic of Palau. We're looking at finfish. And where you see the greenest areas, these are the most suitable for finfish development. And if you go to the next slide, This is a zoom in of the area. Um, and you can see pretty clearly here that the areas that are green are avoiding, we have uh, a marine, um, sorry, a vessel channel that runs through here. So you're gonna have a lot of boats going through there. So you can see that there's a gap there. It also avoids a lot of the coral reefs. It's far enough from shore and deep enough water uh, for fin fish aquaculture. Um, and these are just some examples of um, the results that we have. If you want to explore them further, you can go to the maps.coastalresilience.org slash Palau. We have a live uh, web tool with preliminary results that we'll be uh, updating later this year uh, as we progress through this uh, siting project in Palau. Um, thanks for the opportunity to talk, and I'll turn it over to Stephen. Hello, uh, everyone. Uh, 
My name is uh, Steven Victor. I'm uh, from Palau. For the last five years, I've been leading the sustainable aquaculture uh, development project uh, for the Nature Conservancy here in Palau and across uh, Micronesia. And our uh, goal is really, there are really two goals uh, that we're using aquaculture to try and uh, address. One is uh, development uh, of uh, sustainable livelihoods for local communities, as well as uh, addressing uh, healthy uh, protein source, uh, which I'll talk about uh, why it's important uh, to focus on, on fish uh, uh, within the, the presentation. Uh, next slide, please. So here you see a uh, map of Palau, for those who do not know uh, where we're uh, situated. We're just north of uh, Papua New Guinea uh, and uh, south of Honolulu. So we're sort of in between uh, uh, and right at the edge of uh, what, you, what we call as a coral triangle that we have over 450 coral species, 1,500 uh, species of fish. Uh, and we have uh, probably some of the most uh, intact uh, coral reef systems that still remain uh, globally and why uh, we are being very careful on uh, development of aquaculture, as we've seen and we've heard from uh, Robert and, and Julio on, on the potential impact of aquaculture on uh, marine systems. Uh, Palau as a nation has uh, about uh, 20,000 uh, local residents, so fairly a small uh, uh, developing island state. Prior to 2020, uh, we had over 100, 120,000 uh, visitors, mainly visitors from Asia, who has uh, appetite for seafood. And the uh, main economy for Palau is uh, tourism. Uh, and with the importance of uh, tourism, uh, Palau uh, in the early 2000s established a protected areas network uh, in hopes of ensuring that uh, while we're promoting tourism, we are also managing our reef systems, which are important attractions for uh, our visitors. So, so on the environmental policy side, Palau has established over uh, 30 coastal protected areas. And in uh, 2015, uh, Palau uh, closed off 80% of its uh, exclusive economic zone uh, from commercial fishing. So that uh, policy went into effect uh, January 1st uh, of 2020, leaving only 20% that is uh, fished uh, uh, commercially. Uh, next slide, please. So as a developing uh, island state uh, 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 who has very much uh, been influenced by Western cultures, uh, Palau uh, relies heavily on imported foods. So you can see on this slide uh, a lot of canned meat. We also import uh, chicken, beef, pork, uh, and that sustains uh, local population and tourism. So Palau ranks probably a third of them globally as the most obvious uh, people per capita. So this leads to a lot of uh, non-communicable disease such as uh, diabetes, uh, heart attacks, uh, and other uh, non-communicable disease that are prevalent within our local population. So, Focusing on uh, food security for Palau is important and mainly ensuring that there's healthy feed, uh, healthy source of protein from fish uh, that can um, sustain local population. Next slide, please. So why is it important to focus on uh, developing uh, aquaculture fish species to help sustain uh, 
local source of uh, fish protein. Uh, as we've seen globally, our uh, reefs are being impacted by climate change. So in 1998, the uh, Palau's coral reef uh, experienced uh, up to 98% bleaching events and reefs and an average of about 30% uh, coral mortality. So these are widespread events that are becoming more prevalent and uh, dead reefs do not support uh, healthy uh, fish population, and so that has the potential to impact uh, uh, food security for Palau. And as we continue to rely on fishing, next slide, please. Uh, Palau has uh, continued to Palau has continued to over harvest the reef, uh, leading to uh, declining fisheries resources, which again pose. Uh, long-term threat to Palau's food security. Uh, Palau's have begun to get uh, fish that are not mature enough to reproduce, leading to a lot of uh, declining uh, reef fisheries, particularly uh, groupers uh, uh, and uh, snappers. Uh, herbivorous fish such as part fish are also being targeted as they're uh, our, our preference for such species locally. And when uh, Palau still allowed for export, uh, there was also a lot of export of part fish to nearby islands uh, such as Guam and uh, Saipan. Next slide, please. So in 2015, uh, Palau began exploring uh, hatchery production of uh, rabbit fish, mainly two species of rabbit fish. The picture you see is uh, Siganus uh, linearis, and, and the other species uh, that is being uh, uh, actually produced is uh, Siganus uh, fusescens. These species were chosen because uh, they have uh, local preference uh, within the local uh, community and, and also within the uh, Asian visiting uh, tourists, they also prefer uh, this species as it is also found uh, within the South, Southeast Asian, particularly in, in Taiwan where they've uh, produced this uh, in hatchery before. So we chose this species uh, because we felt uh, there's a local market. Uh, any species that uh, uh, would be produced for export uh, would be uh, a bit uh, unsustainable for uh, local communities to uh, farm because the cost of uh, transport and the cost of uh, feeds outweighs the products that uh, uh, are produced, uh, aquaculture products that are produced in Southeast Asia and mainly the market that we would potentially uh, garner for export for uh, cultured fish would be the Asian market, and we can't really compete with uh, uh, fish produced within the Southeast uh, Asian region. We import all the materials for uh, developing the cages. All the feeds are imported. Even uh, technical export is get imported to help uh, with hatchery production. So cost of export of uh, fish becomes very high. So we chose these two species to look at uh, environmental as well as financial feasibility of farming uh, these uh, two species, uh, both for sustainable livelihoods and then uh, to address uh, uh, food security for uh, our ones. Next slide, please. So we have worked with uh, the Palau uh, government uh, since 2016. Uh, the Palau uh, government uh, in 2010 established a uh, Finfish hatchery with a partnership uh, uh, in partnership with the uh, uh, Taiwan government. Uh, so Taiwan government sent uh, expert uh, to Palau and they have about five year uh, assignment here where they're focused on uh, Hatchery production, uh, both research as well as uh, 
uh, production for farms. So they first started with a grouper and they did a release which uh, uh, showed that uh, it was not sustainable to financially sustainable to use that approach to try and uh, uh, improve uh, wild stocks for groupers. And so uh, they switched to rabbit fish. And as I mentioned, rabbit, rabbit fish has shown a uh, potential for local market. Uh, and so they started uh, in 2016 mass production of Two species of rabbit fish, as I said, Siganus fusescens and Siganus uh, linearis. Currently, the hatchery can produce uh, roughly about 30,000 uh, fingerlings annually. They're increasing hatchery space, uh, and in three years, they'll have a target of about 60,000 uh, fingerlings uh, that can be uh, produced within the hatchery. Next slide, please. We had worked uh, with fishermen to try and transition them from uh, uh, fishing to farming the sea, uh, particularly uh, uh, rabbit fish. There's this uh, gentleman in a green uh, long shirt that you see is the owner of this uh, Nabama aquaculture farm. And he had focused on uh, milk fish, but the fries are imported from Taiwan. Uh, so there's uh, still a, a cost consideration for uh, farming in Palau as there's very limited hatchery space. And so we cannot be produce, producing multiple species uh, within uh, the existing hatchery facilities. So we partner with farmers to try and uh, uh, encourage them to farm uh, rabbit fish. So, to date, there are about uh, nine uh, active farmers uh, whom we are working with uh, to pilot uh, farming rabbit fish, mainly looking at, uh, as Chilio showed some of the slides of uh, rabbit fish that uh, has deformity. Uh, that's, those are probably slides he took from the time uh, he was in Palau, where uh, the farms are experienced deformity and it may be due to uh, uh, location uh, of where the farms are uh, uh, and the impact of water quality on the survival and growth and the health of uh, uh, rabbit fish. Next slide, please. So within this uh, sort of pilot phase for the rabbit fish uh, aquaculture in Palau. As uh, Jonathan mentioned, we are working on uh, siting analysis to identify the most uh, suitable areas uh, to farm uh, these rabbit fish that will increase uh, their growth and also minimize uh, en environmental impact. Uh, we're in the process of uh, going through uh, to collect uh, field data to validate some of these areas that uh, we've identified uh, as priority areas. In addition, uh, there currently uh, there is currently no uh, aquaculture regulations uh, in Palau, so it's considered a, a development. So whenever someone would like to uh, establish a farm, they would simply uh, apply for. Uh, a water quality permit and they consider it as uh, developments so it goes through a very strict and rigorous uh, uh, requirement such as uh, development of environmental impact assessment and water quality monitoring and whatnot so we hope that uh, using this uh, siting analysis we can help to pre-identify areas that we it can work with the government to develop uh, regulation that can regulate and prioritize those areas that will make uh, uh, aquaculture uh, much easier to acquire a permit uh, than what it is now. And then also we're expanding um, our sustainable uh, aquaculture approach to include the uh, child clam and child clam uh, 
Palau has already a uh, three-year experience with Chan Clam. There's a dedicated uh, Chan Clam uh, uh, hatchery. Uh, we're trying to see how we can increase production uh, to help support uh, increasing uh, farming that will help uh, uh, restock the reef as well as provide uh, for food security and, uh, and livelihood through uh, ornamental trade of uh, live chan clams. We're also working with uh, our government partner and uh, farming mangrove crop and expanding uh, hatchery facility to be able to locally produce uh, milk fish fries. Next slide, please. And that's uh, the end of uh, my presentation. Uh, thank you. I'll turn it over back to Tiffany and uh, Sherry. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen, and um, everyone else for presenting the really interesting uh, presentations. So now we're going to open the webinar up for discussion and questions. Um, remember, you can type your question into the question box, or you can raise your hand and we'll unmute you to ask your question. Um, so go ahead and um, put your questions in the question box and I'll turn it over to Tiffany um, to start asking questions. And every I invite pr uh, pr pre pre presenters to turn on your cameras. Thanks, Sherry. Um, we've already gotten some questions, which is great. So thanks so much to people that have been asking. But again, feel free to put more questions into the box or to raise your hand. So I'm just going to go down the list here. Um, so we have a question here. Um, are commercial feed pellets available that use non-marine sources? So thinking um, along the lines of reducing impacts to harvesting from wild stocks um, that are used to produce feed for aquaculture. Um, you know, is this maybe a question that uh, Julio or Stephen may want to answer? Um, just know there was a feed trial <laughs> um, that uh, they conducted on this very topic. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, hello. Um, so yes, there are um, a lot of feeds now being formulated specifically to use less um, meals and oils from fish that are being caught in the wild. Um, as Tiffany mentioned, um, in 2019, I was in Palau um, to test um, different feeds that were formulated with uh, plant-based proteins. Um, so some were made with um, lentin, uh, which is a similar to duckweed, and some were made with soybean and soybean protein concentrate, and they actually performed um, better than the commercial feed that used uh, fish meal. Um, so there are uh, commercial feeds out there that um, do have less, and if not, um, no inclusion of, uh, of fish meal. Um, but that is, uh, that is what the industry is slowly going towards, is alleviating that pressure from wild stocks. Because I do agree with you, it doesn't make sense to catch fish from the wild to make food for fish that we're farming. Um, it's not very sustainable. So yes, there is a lot of interest in alternative sources of protein and lipids uh, for farmed fish. Thanks. Just maybe yeah. add, add a little bit on that. I think there's like some species of fish that are better candidates for marine free diets than others. Um, like freshwater fishery, freshwater aquaculture, for example, really probably do not really require much fish meal or fish oil, but it is still used in a number of cases in low amounts. And that's getting towards uh, more closer towards commercial production of fish meal and fishery oil. We actually had uh, fishery feeds. We actually had a participated in a competition, a challenge prize competition, um, to see who could produce the most fish without using fish meal. And uh, a Chinese company uh, was able to win that challenge for with production of tilapia. Marine species in most cases are less good candidates for fish meal and fish oil replacements, but there's some exceptions. Like that's one of the really attractive things about rabbit fish is it's really a herbivorous fish, and we could create a feed that is uh, fish meal or fish oil free. free. 
And uh, currently the feed that had been used was a more of a, a diet that was created for milk fish, it did include some fish meal and fish oil. We created this, this challenge with Julio or this uh, test with Julio uh, and team to see if how well that worked. Um, in terms of like the mainstream production species, salmon, this has been like a major effort to move towards uh, fish meal, fish oil free feeds, probably in the fish oil replacement diets, we are closer along, probably Vera Morris is the company that's uh, furthest along in commercial production of uh, fish oil uh, replacements. And some of that product is uh, reaching market now, but it's not widespread yet. But there's been a lot of R&D going into this space and it's really good to, to see that. Thanks, Robert. Um, we actually have um, a, we have a lot of people asking questions in the chat, which is great. But um, we'll go over to the person who has their hand raised right now. Uh, Sherry, would you be able to unmute from the gap? Okay, so it looks like I can unmute Miguel, but I think Miguel also has to unmute on the other side as well. Okay, give him a few seconds. See if we can figure that out. If not, we'll go on to the next question. Maybe message him directly. <laughs> Ask him if he's able to unmute. All right. Well, um, we'll give him some time to figure out how to un unmute him and we'll go down to the next question. Um, so what made you choose these two species? I and mean, this is directed towards semen. Did you test others? What are the commercial size of the fish? And how many tons are you in capacity um, in terms of producing? Stephen. So thanks for the question and uh, the species were chosen uh, based on uh, uh, local preference for raw fish here in Palau. Uh, uh, as I've mentioned, uh, the Palau National Aquaculture has tested the grouper before, uh, but mainly uh, they did the uh, wild release rather than uh, farming because uh, of the cost of farming and so they weren't encouraging uh, farming uh, grouper. The wild release, uh, they didn't do proper monitoring to see how successful it was and by all indication it wasn't as successful as uh, because the uh, fingerlings were released at a very small size so they probably were eaten to keep them uh, in the hatchery for uh, size that when they released increased survival would uh, end on to the cost of uh, operating the facility and that's why they chose to uh, release them at a very small size. Uh, currently, uh, as I've mentioned, there are nine active farmers uh, farming rabbit fish with an average of two cages. So uh, there's uh, not enough rice to uh, provide to the fishermen on a basis where once they harvest, they get uh, rice uh, replenished. So it's uh, uh, gates can hold up to 2,000 fish, and the harvest rate uh, is around uh, 300 pounds uh, of fish per gate. Uh, and so it's still at a very uh, initial stage of uh, exploration. And as uh, Julio uh, showed uh, the picture, there's still a lot of uh, disease and deformity in uh, uh, this fish. And it's primarily due to where they're being farmed. And so we're hoping that uh, we can use the sighting analysis to then further test uh, uh, cages up to 10 within a site to see how uh, fit, what's the feasibility uh, of producing more fish uh, at a lower cost. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Um, all right, we're going to go on to the next question. Um, great presentations. Thank you all so much. Um, how do you protect these farms from intense storms like hurricanes? Do we have anyone who wants to field that question? So let me start and then uh, I think uh, Jonathan has uh, through the siding analysis. Uh, so 
primarily uh, one of the reasons why uh, the farms are located uh, where they are now is uh, to try and avoid the uh, damage uh, from high winds. Uh, uh, and as you look at the design of the cages, they're made from uh, uh, two by fours. And so they're simply uh, screwed and nailed. And so they're not as uh, hardy as uh, materials that we would order from a manufacturer, let's say in China. And so the current cage materials are not enough to withstand uh, uh, strong waves and high wind, and therefore uh, they're located where they're located are uh, currently located to uh, uh, avoid that. And uh, let me give it to Jonathan to uh, answer it uh, based on the analysis. Jonathan? Sure, sure. So um, when we think about siting analysis, um, in the example in Palau, we actually ran a wave model to help identify where there would be um, stronger wave action. But one way to avoid things like hurricanes is you would pick the leeward side or the less wind-driven side of the island that has more protection. Um, another option is actually moving the cages closer to shore during this type of event. Uh, so there are different options for avoiding um, really strong weather like hurricanes. Thanks. That's actually um, the next question, um, maybe for you, Jonathan, as well. Which parameters, um, currents, wind, depth, bottom type productivity are the most relevant in terms of siting for a mariculture of fish? So maybe this is for you, Robert. Anyone else wants to take this? Sure. So there's... Um, for the Palau, again, Palau example, um, we started off with uh, our own bathymetry layer. So we got our depth profile, and that was a, a really important layer to have. Uh, not only does it show the bottom depths, but it also helps identify uh, areas that may have coral as well. So where you have um, shallower areas you want to avoid. Um, currents, uh, waves are very important as well. Currents, I would say, um almost more so than waves waves you kind of want to avoid currents you you actually need so you need to you need to have some uh currents in the area to help flush the area uh, ensure that there's enough dissolved oxygen um for those so those i would say currents would be more important than the waves um, mm -hmm. anyone else um otherwise you can go on to the next question All right, um, and we do have a question from Miguel. He's able to type it in. Sorry, we couldn't hear him before. Uh, this is Miguel's question. We know that most of aquaculture species in the tropics are brackish water species, um, like rabbit fish. For them to optimize their growth, they need to be in areas affected by mixing of fresh water. So to grow them in deeper water that is 100% oceanic water may affect this growth. How can we address this consideration? Is there an effect that um, ocean water, um, non brackish water, is going to have on rabbit fish? Maybe that's, is that something that's going to affect their growth? It's a really good question, which uh, I don't have an answer uh, to at the moment. And part of uh, this uh, pilot, we would probably uh, look at. Well, we have a, a farm uh, up in the North Island where the impact of uh, run, uh, salinity uh, uh, didn't fluctuate because it's on an atoll. So, and it's hard to say whether it was the feeding that had affected the growth or the salinity. So we've grown uh, the species within areas that uh, sees uh, less, uh, fluctuation in salinity and they did uh, grow, but it was hard to determine whether it was, uh, uh, there was an impact of uh, salinity because the feeding wasn't always consistent. So we look into that. Thank you. Yeah, I, want, I wanted to quickly add to that. And I do believe there is an impact on growth if you go from a fish like rabbit fish that naturally lives in brackish water and you put them in 100 percent 
marine water, there has to be some kind of physiological process that makes it harder for the fish to osmoregulate. Um, if it's in a if it's in a full marine environment, it might have a harder time to do so. Um, but that's why it's very important to once a species has been selected and that is the species you want to farm, it's then important to go through um, the site selection process um, and using all these different GIS tools to figure out where's the most ideal location that ideally has a mix of fresh and water. But I think it's a very good question because yes, we wanna move further away from the coast because it can you know impact the coastal waters but at the same time it's kind of a, a give or take situation but i think it's, it's a very good question yeah i think this like brings up like a more general principle around um you know on one hand you have like an environmental consideration around depth and current which is generally not always found farther from the coast versus a productivity factor which miguel is implying you know, salinity, which may be closer to the coast, is better for the species. Now, those are kind of maybe coming into conflict or dramatically narrow the sites in which this may uh, be present. So, like the first thing, as Julio had said, is like, can we find some sites that do meet the intersection of both? But I think the thing that we do not want to be doing is compromise our environmental values for the sake of production. That would not be what we would want to want to go forward and do. Thanks, guys. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I have a question here for Jonathan. Uh, you spoke about mathematical models and weighting of variables to predict the best site and locations. Can you speak to the process, if there is one, to evaluate a location and validate your model once a farm is located to measure the impact the farm has and what adjustments might be needed to the siting models going forward? Uh, yeah, so. Uh, just talking a little bit more about the model. Um, so we use a multi-criteria decision analysis. Uh, we don't weight uh, individual variables. We give them all equal weighting. Um, and we, we use a three system scoring where we use zero for incompatible, 0. 0.5 for areas that uh, may be compatible, but not 100% compatible, and then one for most compatible. Um, and then with that result, uh, if a farm is chosen, um, you can actually do one more step before then. You can run um, what's known as a, a carrying capacity model that looks at you know, the influence of uh, nutrients in that area um, with multiple farms. So there's one more step that you can do before that. Um, but then once the farm is sited, then it relies more on the, um, the monitoring process that's in place that Julio spoke about. So once the farm is in place, then monitoring takes over to, uh, I guess, evaluate the, the success of that farm and um, ensure that there's no effect on the environment surrounding the farm. So it, it becomes uh, less of a suitability model approach. And then once the farm's established, it's it's strictly just uh, on monitoring and planning that was done beforehand. Thanks, Jonathan. <clears throat> All right, on to the next question. Um, so it's good day. At my workplace, we've been utilizing tilapia in an aquaponic system. My question is, what can be done to prevent the stock from breeding in the tanks? Anybody want to grab this guy? Um, I think I think with that one, you would want to try your best to remove um, males and females. I think once you have a tank with males and females and they reach the point of sexual maturity, then they're going to start breeding um, and get aggressive towards each other. Um, I know with aquaponics and specifically tilapia, you can treat the fish when they're larvae to have them all be male. So then you have an all male culture. Um, but if you don't have access, it's a chemical that you need to be approved and all that. But I think best option will be to separate males and females once you can determine their sex. Um, and then that would uh, potentially reduce them um, for reproducing in the tanks. Thanks, Olivia. Um, let's see. 
All right, we have a question here about cages. Uh, do you have any more information on the characteristics of the cages and how to assemble them? And I know that on the on the toolkit, we do have a little bit more information about cages themselves. Um, I do not believe we have any instructions on how to assemble them. Is this something that anyone would be able to speak to or provide a resource? So for the cages uh, we're using in Palau, they uh, were uh, assembled by uh, our government partners. They're simply uh, two by fours that are uh, put together on top of uh, floaters. Uh, the main uh, challenge uh, is getting the appropriate netting uh, for the gates, uh, which is not available locally, uh, as well as the floats. Uh, it took uh, several trials for the government staff to get the gates materials and the design to uh, what uh, is appropriate for the location. So I, I know there are uh, uh, cage materials that you can order from manufacturers and they would come with instructions on how to assemble them. But uh, the materials, uh, the design we used uh, in Palau is more of uh, our own uh, design that we established. So. Thanks, Stephen. Um, we have a question here. Um, do any of the parasites of fish, um, the, of the farm fish, have the ability to or transfer to the human food chain? Is there anybody that wants to grab this question about the potential of parasites um, that Julia talked about in terms of ensuring um, good monitoring to try to prevent the parasites. Is there the potential of that transferring into the human food chain? So most of the parasites we're talking about are ectoparasites like sea lice um, or gill flukes or other things like that. And those are really like through the processing and filleting and cooking of the, the fish. Uh, I don't believe they really pose any um, substantial human health issues. Now, there are parasite issues associated with eating seafood and some uh, mostly uh, wild fish, uh, worms in the uh, flesh of the fish. This is a particular concern with a lot of freshwater fish, but some saltwater fish as well. Um, the yellowtail kingfishes, the codfish are known to have those kind of worms. Um, they're usually not harmful if cooked, but they could be uh, transferred into a human host. CDC and FDA. And, um, but when we, when we aquaculture those same species, generally the fish don't actually have those worms and, and the fillets and meat themselves. And this is kind of a related question. We'll keep on this line. It says currently there's a limited variety of therapeutics available to fish in comparison to other farmed land-based animals. Is TNC supporting, investing, or encouraging research to grow the availability of medications to keep fish healthy and reduce disease exposure in open water environments? Well, there's fish welfare is is really important, right? I think no one here would say that we should be growing fish in a way uh, that's not respecting those animals. And uh, for treating the health of the animal, sometimes it is appropriate to use antibiotics. And the suite of antibiotics in some country, or antibiotics that are available in some countries uh, is limited, such as the United States. That techno those animal drugs, there's a reason to advance them but they need to be used responsibly. So there are really well-documented um, evidence of abuses of antibiotics in the aquaculture industry um, in places around the world. We know that because FDA does sample products for trace residues of antibiotics and they trigger import alerts from those countries. Um, so abuse of antibiotics and abuse of animal health treatments is something we're absolutely not in support of. 
Um, I have a question here about multitrophic aquaculture. Uh, so what about multitrophic aquaculture? Do you think that this could be good for coral reef areas? Is there anyone who'd like to talk about multitrophic um, and just whether or not that's a strategy that could be employed in coral reef areas? Yeah, we, we sort of consider uh, that, uh, especially for uh, rabbit fish uh, that are being grown uh, uh, in areas like this of growing, uh, let's say, sea cucumber or uh, giant clams, we haven't quite uh, uh, gone that far to test uh, the feasibility of uh, doing that, but uh, we think that uh, it's good idea to explore. Uh, we just haven't been able to get to that level of uh, experiment where we're doing that. Thanks, Stephen. I've had a couple questions come in um, that are asking whether or not the recording is going to be available and whether or not we have PDFs of the PowerPoint. And I just wanted to say to everybody, yes, we will make this recording available. And we can also have the PDF available of the PowerPoint. However, the toolkit is also now online, and so there are a lot of downloadable resources directly on the toolkit, too, as a resource. So I just wanted to pause and say that real quick. And I think we actually need to the end of our questions. Let me see if there's anybody else that's raised their hand. If there's anybody else that has a question, it's really well timed because it's 826, and I know that um, we need a minute or two before to close, but I guess I'm going to do a bit of a last call and um, see if anybody has any last questions. And thank you to everybody for your really, really great questions. These are uh, really important questions to ask and we appreciate them. All right. I'm not seeing any other questions. Um, Sherry? Oh, wait, hold on. We've got one from Christopher May, just under the under the line, under the wire. <laughs> Do you have enough time, Sherry? Sure. All right. Uh, if you want to um, unmute Christopher. Okay, hold on one second. Is that a hand up or just the question? I'm seeing a hand, but oh, the hand's down. <laughs> okay, all right. Then I think that we um, have had all the questions, um, which again, everybody. Great. Okay, yes. Well, thanks again, everyone, for joining us and for the great discussion. Um, it looks like we got to all of our questions, Tiffany, today. I think so. That's we cool. have, um, I think so. We have one question from Christopher that he just typed in. So has parrotfish been considered for mariculture? So um, if anyone has any experience with parrotfish, that is our last question. <laughs> Julio, Dan, ever try to culture uh, parrotfish? I, I'm not aware of anyone trying to culture parrotfish. It must be a pretty hard species to work with. Also, probably not a particularly interesting fish for food, but you could probably see the interest there in the aquarium species. So, oh, Julio, you're muted. Yeah, as far as I know, uh, as far as I know, there isn't too much, you know, technology or commercial interest in in parafish. Um, I do see that they have a value in terms for the coral reefs as the overall health but when we're looking more at the commercial side um, there doesn't seem to be too much push um, for the species okay thanks guys great, well, yeah great well with that we'll go ahead and wrap up and i just wanted to um put a couple links up here so we have the link to the aquaculture toolkit so please go check it out we hope it's useful to you and your work and also um, there is a post about this webinar on the Reef Resilience Network Forum. So if you're interested in continuing the discussion, please go there um, and um, 
find that post and you can um, start a discussion there. So thanks to everyone um, and have a great day.